So without further ado, let me introduce the panel. The panel. First is Janet Clues, um, CN, ZM, QSO. She's the chair of the Auckland Council's Seniors Advisory Panel. Uh, she's been involved in local government for more than 50 years, serving as the Waitakere City Councillor since the city was formed in 1989, and she previously served as Deputy Mayor and Mayor of Glen Eden Borough. Uh, Janet Clues, would you join us on stage? And Gloria Go, um, uh, as you can see, she is the Senior Manager, Social Services, CNSST Foundation, and just amazingly <laughs> fine woman. Uh, with our Chinese communities, and, and one of the largest Asian community organisations in New Zealand, providing social services of education and social housing for 15,000 people a year. That's astonishingly good. And I'd like now to introduce uh, Dr. Elizabeth uh, Ann Broadbent, Professor of Health Psychology at the University of Auckland. <laughs> I'm so fond of uh, Elizabeth because she is so fond of robots. And uh, I also feel that robots are going to play a larger part uh, in our lives uh, in that technology as companions. And would you believe it, I think friends uh, to many people that are alone and lonely. I'd love her to talk a little bit about that. Um, she initially trained as an electrician, an electrical engineer, electronic engineer at Canterbury University to pursue her interests in robotics. Um, so this is an incredible, wonderful brain working on how we can move our thinking, I guess. Um, and then I have uh, Megan uh, Tyler. Um, where is, is Megan here? <laughs> Hello, Megan. There you are. Uh, I also think that she almost needs no introduction, but she has an enormously important job, which is Chief of Strategy at the Auckland Council. Um, she's a proud Westie, I might say, uh, but she discovered planning <laughs> as a professional in the last year. And uh, I'm so proud that Megan has that job. Uh, it's a an enormously serious job uh, for a woman of great, uh, I think, respect and thinking about how cities operate, uh, how cities are part of us, uh, both the political city, the social city and the cultural city. So that adds to uh, a terrific panel. And now Glenn Wilcox, Deputy Chairman, Independent Māori Statutory Board and a superb New Zealander. I might say he lived in Titarangi for a long time, and he's a dear friend of all of us. So um, that completes our panel, and I'd like now to ask, I guess, the first questions. Um, so the, uh, to you, Janet, um, the question is, there is a huge pool of expertise within the sen senior community, and how can this be uh, harnessed, I guess, for the benefit of society as a whole? Janet, your thoughts? It's a bit hard to gather them after your introduction, but I'll try. <laughs> could I, before I speak about that, could I just say <clears throat> how appreciative we are on the panel of the work that's been done since the decision was taken to join the network, the Age Friendly Network, because it hasn't been easy, but Council and, and particularly the staff that support us, I'd like to thank them. And I'd also like, in the, in the same vein as, as Glenn alluded to, remember those who went before. We had, this is the second seniors panel, and some of our colleagues on the first panel did not return to the panel. So we'd like to play, pay tribute to those people who were there and started the work in council. We got to a, a full stop at the end of that three years which was rather traumatic, we thought. And so we had to regather our forces and come back. And Council then got the message and has done what they've done now, and we appreciate it. So particularly I'd like to thank, uh, remember Margaret Devlin, who was the chair of that 
committee because she even contacted me last night to say she wasn't able to be here today but would have loved to have been. So we do appreciate that and uh, all the work that goes on behind the scenes to get us to where we are and the fact that we're even there at all and being listened to. So why I've raised this as my question is because it was one of the arguments that we took to council that there was a huge untapped, or partially untapped anyway, uh, pool of expertise within the senior community. And not long ago, I attended a business breakfast, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But the, the main thing, of course, to, to remember is that there's a huge amount of volunteering done by, I'm sure, everybody in this room. Sometimes it goes unnoticed, but it is there and it is, it is appreciated by, by the people that you are volunteering for, of course. But the wider community needs to know about that. And I think everyone, certainly those of us who've been in local government for a while, recognise that without volunteers, our society would actually crumble because there's never enough money to do everything, is there? And we know that. And this is not about being greedy oldies the age-friendly thing, let's say that for a start. It's about being age-friendly. It's not spelt with a D, it's not aged, it's age-friendly, that means for all ages. And if we get the young ones right and the old ones right, it's right for everybody. So, but coming back to the um, expertise that, that's there, I went to a business breakfast where there was a, a very high-powered panel of professional men who are running huge businesses that are on the on the international stage. And one of them, Bob, was the the group general manager for Glide Path, yes, a woman. Yes. And remembering that Glide Path, now a huge international company that that. Um, provides all the infrastructure for airport luggage and that sort of thing, um, began it, its little... In Kelston. In little... In Glen Eden. That part of Kelston Sorry is Glen that. Eden. God, don't get that right. Not power lands. <laughs> <laughs> he, at that stage, I'll just have to add that, he at that stage had no idea that Cowrie lands was down the bottom of the road and it was not part of Glen Eden. <laughs> However, to get back to what we were talking about. <clears throat> this went on at the council when I was the mayor, of course. I can tell and, you that. <laughs> and we had to have, he, he was always the one that said the jokes. We weren't allowed to. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't that good, Janet. Anyway, um, the discussion was, was an excellent one. It was very uplifting, actually, before breakfast. Um, and then they all contributed, and one of the things that came out of that, that early part of the discussion was the fact that nowadays the, the younger workforce seems to only want to stay for about five years, and then they're off. And, of course, that wasn't so in our earlier work time, was it? you went into something, you might not stay there for all, all your life, but you'd stay there for a long time and gradually take your promotion if that's what you wanted. But what, um, what came out of that was that they were having trouble, of course, keeping things um, flowing in the right direction. And, and I, I always worry about where the institutional knowledge goes to when that sort of um, rotation happens. So I was about to ask a question, but I didn't have to because there was someone in the audience, and I think he might be here tonight, um, who asked it for me. And he brought up the subject of the fact that older people actually were very, very loyal to their companies, that they stayed for a long time. 
And why didn't some of these businesses look at taking on older people that might want to work two or three days a week instead of a full full time occupation? So that sounded pretty good. Anyway, they all discussed it. And one of the businesses that was represented on that panel was a, an HR business. And the man had been in the corporate world, had moved into his own business and had been in business for seven years and was now doing very well indeed. And so he was questioned on that. And he said, yes, he would be going back to rethink how he interviewed and developed his, his um, suggestions to the client about how he could perhaps handle this, this problem and help, therefore, the business, because the skills of the older person, if it was in the right direction, would be able to be used to mentor young ones, help them through, show them the way. And while everything does change, the sort of person that's been in in a high-powered job there would still be interested in the changes that were going on, I'm sure. So that was that was where um, thought, the thought came from about the, the, the lack of institutional knowledge. And I think we've seen that in local government, yeah. having gone through two um, reorganisations of local government in Auckland. The first time was really traumatic when we went from the smaller boroughs into the larger cities. And I think this last one has been very traumatic for staff, which I think is unfortunate, although I think that Auckland Council has tried in latter years, since they've got themselves established more, more securely, to, to encourage back some of the older people that they had... Um, put to one side, let's say, at the beginning. Put out to pasture. Yes, oh, put yeah. out to pasture, but I was being polite. Right. Thank um, you, Gemma. Thank you. So, uh, you know, uh, they do try, I think, and, and that is a very good thing to happen because nobody knows everything, Thank do you. they? Thank you. And we can all support one another. So I just want you to think about that and see whether you would be prepared to think that way when you younger ones that are not yet retired get to that stage, whether you would like to work <coughs> shorter hours and, and still keep your hand in, as it were, and you older people, whether you would be interested in, in doing that sort of thing too, to mentor and work with others. So Thank you very much. Thank you. Funny. Very good answer. I see that the uh, uh, Slido is giving us lots of questions, but I'm going to move now to Gloria. Gloria, welcome. Neha. And uh, it's so good to do you uh, to be here with a, a question to you. As you know, Auckland is now the world's top in the top four diverse uh, cities. While we plan for age-friendly Auckland, it's important to engage, if we all would agree, with the ethnic older people's community. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Um, I mean, you do amazing things, and it's a terrific CV. Tell us a little bit about you and how you do it. Yes. Thank you for the question, Sir Bob Harvey. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here to share with you as a panel speaker today. Uh, actually, I have a mission today. I want to refresh your understanding about our ethnic community and ethnic uh, elderly community uh, in Auckland today. Hopefully, my conversation will contribute to that point today. Uh, so firstly, I'd like to talk about um, uh, my first view is that we uh, encourage the attitude, uh, the proper and the positive attitude towards the ethnic aging population and the community. Uh, because actually, uh, as you know, the majority of them, uh, you know about the, the standard format of our living like a family is a three-generation family in Auckland, as you know. We have the grandparents, parents, and the younger generation. And the grandparents, the Asian generation, they were brought uh, into New Zealand through the family category immigration uh, with their skilled migrant children. Actually, uh, 
because of their uh, language and cultural barriers here, they have limited engagement uh, and contribution to uh, because of those uh, those barriers. But actually, they are the group with um, intelligence and also with wisdoms, and they bearing the great values from the old traditions. That's educating the younger generation. And their great contribution to our society actually is that they are supporting the uh, family chores, taking care of the grandchildren. Well, our parents, like me and my husband, both of us are the full-time workers. Actually, without their support, we are not able to do full-time work to contribute to New Zealand society. That's the reality. Yep, so um, thanks to our parents and the ethnic uh, aging community in Auckland, with their support and contribution, we are able to maximize our strengths and skills and knowledge to contribute to our Auckland and our society. That's my first point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Uh, so uh, I do encourage the uh, respectful and the positive attitudes towards them, even though they might have limited skills to communicate with you, but they have their hearts, they want to contribute. And one more example for this is that after like the younger generation grown up, they started to contribute and to in integrate into the society by using their own skills. Uh, one typical example is that I worked together with one senior dancing group. And the last collaboration we had was a multicultural event for Southern Cross campus in Manukau. And uh, we organized a cultural session uh, for s over 700, 700 local students. And uh, they performed, the dancing group, they performed the traditional dance for the children while I did the cultural presentation. So that's a wonderful contribution from them, even though they had the language barrier, but they used their culture and the art skills to celebrate the diversity and to promote the culture, so which was really respected and valued. So they actually, for the elderly community, they do want to contribute, uh, even though they have their barriers over there. So that's another example. Thank you. Thank yes. you very much. Thank so secondly, uh, as regarding, um, so what we do about the age-friendly planning, it's very important to understand the needs and the values, actually. So uh, for needs of the ethnic community, uh, apparently I think all of you have been aware of the cultural and the language barrier as the number one barrier for them to live in an uh, uh, English-speaking country even though they try to make efforts to study English, but they do have still the barrier is still there. And the CNCST Foundation, we organized a 550 people, uh, elderly people survey, and 90% of the participants have been identified that their number one barrier is the language and cultural barrier. Yep. So, and uh, as we all know, social isolation is one of the results causing by that barrier. And, uh, so that they have the limited access to the public facilities, social systems, and even their rights uh, to engage with the community and to vote, to take part in the demographic uh, process and et cetera. So, and uh, I want to share some values uh, and also the historical background with you as well, uh, because this specific generation of the elderly people, actually they, um, were born in a special historic period because uh, before 1978, actually, it was a quite a closed business environment in China. And uh, they had a very uh, difficult uh, time uh, lacking in resources. So their day-to-day uh, -day daily essential needs were not able to be met. So they had those kind of difficult life uh, while they were at their younger age. That's why they carry the value, they want to save something to pass their assets and uh, properties to their next generation. So the next generation can avoid those kind of difficult times. That's their values. So uh, in that case, they actually, they carry a kind of low cost lifestyle. Yeah, so not that like, um, and that they always want to save something and uh, uh, yeah, just uh, give something to their, their children. So that's, that's part of the uh, values. And also, um, 
because of the law and legislations in China, actually, is um, um, according to the law, the children, they are obliged to take care of the elderly where they get aged. So same thing where the children uh, were younger, the parents had the obligation, according to the law, to raise their children. So uh, because of those historical uh, background and also their values, uh, for their lifestyle and also the, uh, their age care choice, uh, where they're getting aged, they prefer a home-based care, actually, instead of the social environment. So that's the current generation that we have. Because uh, they do actually, they have those kind of core family values. They want to be staying at home to have the rest of their life. Yep. So that's one thing I want to share with you. So in conclusion, actually, um, because we are uh, have a diversity population and uh, with the uh, culture and the language barrier, while we do the city planning, it's very important to be aware of the diversity and also to have the culturally and linguistically appropriate strategic planning, mm -hmm. resource allocation, infrastructure, uh, and uh, social support services, and et cetera. And uh, more importantly, and uh, very importantly, is that we carry a respectful and a positive attitude towards the ethnic and also the overall aging population. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Be beautifully, beautifully put. Um, Dr. Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth uh, how might social robotics technology be able to assist older adults with health, loneliness, and isolation? This is all your world, and we're all yours. Okay, uh, thank you. So today I want to talk about um, kind of four types of robots and how they might be helpful for people social isolation and health. So the first type of robot is more of a pet type robot or a companion type robot. And um, several uh, villages in New Zealand have got some of these robots. So one is called Paro and Selwyn Village has bought 13 of these. And these are a seal. So it's built like a baby harp seal. Um, so it's fluffy and it's got um, a heater inside it so that it's body temperature it's got um, sensors all over its body, and you pat it, and it makes seal noises, and it moves its flippers and its tail. Um, and trials with this robot have shown that it can reduce loneliness, and this may be because people get companionship from the robot itself, so they enjoy patting it, and it's like a pet in that way. Um, secondly, other people like talking to them about that robot, so it's like when you take your dog for a walk and people talk to you and they say, what's the name of your dog? Um, how old is he, etc. They talk to you about the robot as well so that it can increase human-to-human -human, um, interactions as well. And this robot has also been shown to have benefits for people with um, uh, dementia and that includes reducing agitation and also reducing depression. So it's... Um, it's, it's over 5,000 of these robots have been sold worldwide. So they're not for everybody. You know, it's, it's mainly the oldest old that they're useful for, um, but a lot of people do find them beneficial. Another kind of robot is more of a cognitive type robot, and there are companies and universities working on these around the world, and they are more like robots that you have at home, and these ones will remind you to do things. So things like reminding you to take your medication, guiding you through some physical exercises, um, telling you about various health conditions that you might have, so providing a bit of education, as well as having functions like monitoring your blood pressure. Um, it's got a sort of telepresence function on it so that you can um, easily have Skype-type conversations with your grandchildren or with a healthcare provider. And research with these robots have also shown that people form a sort of emotional bond with the robot and they talk to it, um, and it can also help improve their adherence to medication and how often they do their exercises. And then there's another kind of robot which is more like providing physical assistance. So these robots tend to be more expensive, 
Um, but they can do things like be attached to a wheelchair to help people who um, might be paraplegic and can't use their arms, so help them to feed themselves, for example. Um, there's also robots that can help with stroke rehabilitation. So um, if you have a stroke, it's important that you do exercises, for example, um, if you, um, movement in your hand and arm and um, to help regrow those brain connections. And so the more you do these exercises, the better, but there aren't enough physiotherapists to help everybody. So robots can help people to practice these movements again and again by providing some guidance. And then just lastly, I want to touch on conversational agents as well, so artificial intelligence. And so um, there's Amazon Alexa, for example, which um, is a speaker. It's very easy to use, and it's very popular in the United States. It's slightly less popular here. But you can talk to this speaker, artificially intelligent speaker, ask it what the weather is like, ask it to tell you a joke, uh, all sorts of things. You, you know, you can ask uh, what this, what's the news today, play this music, and, you know, people are finding that they can be very helpful for looking up, um, asking about um, symptoms as well, like health symptoms and mon um, building in health applications. So those are four kinds of robotic or artificial intelligent technologies that are starting to be used around the world and I think offer great potential to add additional ways of accessing health services and helping people who might be isolated or who cannot um, own their own pets now that they're older um, and may not be as able to get to hospital services. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. <laughs> Terrific. I'm sure there'll be some questions to our panel. That's part of the idea. And, uh, and now, of course, uh, Megan. Megan, our strategic uh, advisor, I guess, for our city and our future. Megan, very warm welcome. Look, it's a real pleasure, Kia ora koutou, uh, to be here tonight. And I do want to leave some time for questions, so uh, let me just be brief. I guess if I could just very quickly say that uh, as a council, we often play, you know, we play a part in all of this. Uh, the central government's also a big player, as are our universities uh, and, and all sorts of other uh, organisations uh, and communities uh, around making this an age-friendly city or, or somewhere that... Um, is comfortable to live in, um, as Janet said, for the young and the old, therefore everybody uh, is comfortable in the city. Sir Bob, uh, in his introduction, um, raised the, um, the World Health Organization Global Network for Age-Friendly Cities and Communities. I've had to write that down because it's, <laughs> it's not natural, but it's a, it's a long word. And so, um, as Sir Bob and Janet said, we we are looking to, uh, to join that network. And so what we're doing right now as a city uh, is engaging uh, as we speak, and this is part of it, uh, on an action plan uh, for an age-friendly city. So I'm hoping that uh, all of you have heard about that. If you haven't, you now have, uh, and we would love to get your involvement in that. Um, but, but that action plan, and, and it's looking for kind of 65, um, age 65 and over, uh, in terms of uh, how the city could better... Uh, develop, have, um, have systems and processes in place to enable uh, it to be as, um, as friendly and as useful as possible. Of course, Auckland uh, and Auckland Council have roles in that in terms of transportation, whether that's uh, the choice of transport, public transport, more affordable transport than just a car, particularly where uh, through age or health uh, someone's unable to drive. We do, you know, we need to provide different opportunities to get out, have that, that social inclusion kind of area. Also, uh, different choices and types of housing. So as, uh, as family units, um, and, and, you know, kind of decrease, you know, over our lifetimes, we may want to, people may want to go into a retirement home, of course, or they may want to live on their own, and so, uh, or, or in couples, and so smaller units, different kinds of, um, you know, of housing choices. And particularly as, as my generation and the generation before grows up, we'll have different kinds of lifestyles. We, we, won't, we won't live on the quarter acre section. No doubt, perhaps not many of you no longer are on a quarter acre section, but no doubt you probably started your life on one. 
So that will change, and so there'll, there'll be more apartments, more terraced housing, more of those um, smaller smaller units, uh, and that, that's also useful for the, uh, for the ager, ageing population as well. Uh, also engagement as a council on anything we do, we really do uh, try and get as much feedback and engagement from, from all our uh, parts of our community, uh, including um, our older community as well. And again, that's been raised, that, that can be diff difficult sometimes, whether that's uh, language uh, and, and ethnic uh, differences, uh, but also the ability to get out, the ability to um, interact, particularly when more and more uh, is based on technology. So we're very aware of that. We're trying to balance the, the technology uh, more and more online versus still the need um, and the importance of face-to-face, -face, um, all those more traditional kinds you know, of talking and engaging with each other. So we have a range of different ways in which you can engage, talk to us, give us feedback. So that's, that's a really important part of, of what we do in council as well. Um, I'll, let me leave it at that, because hopefully there'll be some questions coming through. Megan, they're popping up as, as you speak. Um, can I just jump back quickly to uh, uh, Elizabeth? Um, here's a quick, just a very quick one, but it's so good, I can't resist it. Why did you choose to have a robot seal rather than a robot domestic pet like a cat or dog? Um, it's this, a good question. Yeah. Um, so it's not actually my um, animal. I didn't build it. It's, it's actually built by um, a Japanese researcher called Takanori Shibata. And the reason that he made it a seal instead of a cat is that previously they tried to make robots that look like cats, but it's very difficult to make a robot that is, looks and behaves like a cat because cats run around, they jump up everywhere, um, and people are very familiar with what cats look like. And so people were very critical of these robots. Um, whereas if you make a baby harp seal, most people have never seen a baby harp seal except on TV. And they lie on the ice and do, practically do nothing except maybe wiggle their flippers. So it's much easier to make a robot that doesn't have to run around. All it has to do is wiggle its flippers. <laughs> And since people have never seen one, never had one in their own house before, they don't really know how it behaves. So that's, that's why it's a seal. <laughs> Thank you very much. There's lots of questions heading that way. And finally, in the panel, um, kia ora, Glenn, uh, um, tēnā Would you open up a little on Māori and the partnerships? Well, I suppose this morning I kind of had a reality check um, I've had the flu for the last three weeks, and um, during the midst of that, I found out I'm going to be a grandfather again. And I thought, well, I think I'll ring my mum. So I hadn't been down to see mum, and I rang her, and she was crying. My dad died about a few years back now. And I said, what's wrong, mum? And she said, well, actually, I was feeling a little lonely. And I th it struck me that isolation for for old people and aged people is going to be a real issue that we must learn um, to handle and to manage. It struck me in a way that it never struck me before because for Māori, um, the average age of a Māori person is 24 years. The average age for the general population is 40 there's a big difference. It means that our old people, our komato and queer, are very lonely. Most of their sisters and brothers have died. Most of their family and friends have gone. So it means they're talking to younger generations. And the challenge before us as Māori is how are we going to communicate and draw that knowledge from our komato and queer, but also make them feel part of our society and our generation going forward. This is something that affects Māori uniquely in New Zealand because of this big age difference, but it also is something that will start to affect the general population of New Zealand as we see more and more young Māori come through roughly around this 24-year age group. 
because the, the demographics aren't going to change. And one of the things that I've learnt as time's gone on for Māori as far as age concerns are is how do we look after each other in a way that's traditional but actually has to draw down on the way our society is changing and drawing down on those things that we're learning now. Dementia is one of the many issues that's affecting families and just care for, for our elderly, elderly co-mato and queer in a way that we've never had to address before. And so there's that big issue there of inclusiveness because a family that's all, because we already know that the mean Māori income at that 24 year age group is actually quite low. And that puts an extra burden on that family or that group. So in order to make Auckland an, an aged uh, friendly uh, town or city, we're going to think about, we're going to have to think about how are we going to uh, create the, the, the situation where the young can still be part of the elderly and the elderly can still be part of the young. Because actually there's no difference, it's just age and it's just years. But the wisdom and the knowledge is held in the elderly and the, the get up and go, the kaha, right, as you might call it, is held with the young. And when there's too much kaha, wisdom goes out the door. And when there's too much wisdom or too much knowledge, well, the kaha doesn't actually happen at all. So, you know, it's, it's a matter of balancing those things from a Māori point of view between the rangatahi and those young ones coming through to those ones who are komato and queer and preventing isolation. And I think that's where, if we're going to be an aged uh, age friendly uh, community or society, we're going to have to address those things uh, on a more wider scale than just focusing on the aged, but more about focusing on our whole communities. And within that, for Māori, there's, a, there's another disconnection, unfortunately, and that is for many, and our family were one. When we moved to the city, we always thought we were going to go back home. The reality is we are never going back back to our, our original homesteads because if we all turned up, the place would be overloaded with people. So, I mean, there's an acceptance now and there's more acceptance every day amongst the younger Māori that Auckland is their Tūranga Waiwai. And so by creating that understanding of Tūranga Waiwai, it then, we then need to create that connection for our older people that they have a place here in Auckland. They have a place here that this can be their Tūranga Waiwai as well and that Auckland is there for them as well as it is for our younger people and those generations coming after us. So I just wanted to kind of lay that down. I, again, I don't want to talk too long about this quarter. Mahi, thank there's you. There's a real cope up there. Glenn, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask you to think of your questions now and, and uh, we'll go into question time. And we've got great questions here. I'm going to do one to the panel. And it's obviously many of the disabled community are pretty interested in what we've got to say. So what is being done, planned, with the interface between age-friendly and disabled-friendly, especially those moderately so. Megan, maybe it's you um, and, and Janet. Yes, yeah, so Janet. We've worked with the disability panel on a number of issues. One real win that we had <coughs> was over the central rail link and the Mercury... Um, station up at Parang Happy Road, which was going to be done as the first step, but then there was no money for the other where the lift would be. Now that was absolutely impossible. How would you get someone with a walker or a or a, a um, wheelchair up from where the Mercury Theatre is back up to Parang Happy Road? Impossible. Then they said, oh, well, we'll put a little flat place there and we'll plant a tree and that'll be concrete and you can park. 
sit there for a while and have a rest on your way up. <laughs> so, you know, it didn't compute, did it? No. But thankfully, because of your generosity in paying your rates, the extra money that's, been, that's coming from the petrol tax too will help to have that all done together. So it will happen now, I understand. I'm right, aren't I, Megan? Yes, you are. But we have worked, and we've also done work with um, the disability panel on the work that's been done by the minister on, the, on disability so there's issues. Any, there's good progress there. Yeah. Megan, uh, would you like to add something? Well, the, the only thing I'll add is, um, look, uh, uh, just as Janet said, certainly if we're thinking about public transport, that kind of access... Um, the, f the, the fleet, the bus fleet, the, the trains, I think, are, are pretty good now. Um, but, but we'll continue to make sure that all of that is, um, is, is accessible it will, for whatever that means, whether it's um, disability or just having difficulty getting around. Uh, the other part, and, and Janet just mentioned it, is the government um, is, has got a discussion document out around kind of the building code and building act stuff, which sounds really boring. But part of what we're focusing on is what we call universal design, which again is this kind of code word which just basically means being able to get around and particularly the development of housing, for example, with wide enough door jams, flat areas, ability to live on a ground floor as opposed to just have a garage, say, there and then have to go upstairs. Being able to retrofit a house um, or, de or, um, or design it straight off so that if you need to um, use a wheelchair or some kind of aid, then it's not going to be prohibitively expensive or that you have to move out in order to then perhaps retrofit that um, for those needs as, as you get older or, or through health reasons. So that's uh, we're also focusing on that aspect to get the government to focus more on that from legislation. Thank you. Some questions from the floor. Um, sir, um, we'll find mics, I think. They're coming. Thank you, thank you. Um, let's go with you. Okay. Uh, my question is to you, Megan. Um, you mentioned the uh, advances of technology in terms of providing solutions for ratepayers. I work in a community centre environment. I run a community services trust in my home area. The constant message is isolation. And in my home area, council is closing our service centre. And increasingly that is the case. And, and service centres are moving increasingly towards the centre of Auckland rather than staying on the more extended reaches. That is isolating these communities, and I'm interested to know how you're going to cope with that for the ageing group that doesn't deal with technology well. Thank you. That's an, it's a very real issue. It's a very real issue for other organisations, as you know, banks, there are post offices. We're at the stage where, um, for whether it's efficiency, uh, sometimes cost saving, all, all sorts of reasons. Um, organisations are either centralising or moving to more online and, and technology-driven ways of communicating. Council's no different, so I'm, uh, I won't be able to promise that we won't be, you know, closing service centres or, or changing them because uh, we, we will still be doing that. Um, I do think that it is going to be difficult for some time and therefore we do need to provide um, other ways, like I said, to communicate with, with us. The communities around, you know, as, as a community, we can help each other around that, whether it's giving people lifts, being, you know, checking in on them during the day, you know, all of those kinds of things that we've talked about. That's not about council, that's just being human to human. So there's that, there's a community responsibility, I think, or opportunity there as well. I also wonder, and, and no doubt others will have views, is that um, in, into the next one or two generations, uh, this won't be such an issue in terms of the technology or the online thing. Doesn't mean the isolation will go away though. Um, so yes, council will have a role in that, but I think there's also some collective responsibility as humans and Aucklanders around what that could mean for us and our communities. Thank you, thank you, Megan. Uh, Tenakoto Katoa. Um, sure. My question is kind of responding, responding to Janet about um, age friendly because I take the bus a lot um, daily and with my two kids we help a lot of elderly on and off or make hold a bus so they can make it but when you change when Auckland Council changes the bus number or takes away a line what kind of engagement do you do 
before you actually make those changes with the elderly in particular? Because change is a big deal, whether you're in isolation, you take away a post office, or you're in isolation, you take away all these things that elderly are used to. My kids are as concerned about those changes as I'm sure elderly are. And what is council doing if they do it the next time? Or once they make the change, do they listen to the elderly when they're unhappy with those changes? And for instance, the Mount Eden bus changed from a number that was 274 to like 27R and 278 or something. So I sat on the bus stop for five hours with my kids and helped read buses for elderly because they couldn't tell if it was their bus. Um, so what do you guys do about that is my it question. It looks like, uh, Jenna, yeah. It's, first of all, it's part of the, the council family, of course, Auckland Transport that deals with that. Um, and we've had discussions in inverted commas with Auckland Transport too about similar things. And ours focused most recently on the changes to the hospital buses because they decided that people could now walk another four or five hundred yards to get to Green Lane Clinic. They didn't seem to understand what we were talking about, that if someone with a walker gets on a bus at Point Chevalier, and that's where a lot of the, the uh, noise was coming from, they want to get off at the building, not halfway up the road back towards home. And they, but they, they, I think they have taken that argument on board, and there are changes being made in that particular one. But yes, they do now come to not just to the local boards and to the governing body, but they do come to the panels as well. They have learnt that, it, that we are quite helpful and we don't bite. But we might if they don't listen. Thank you. Another question there. Thank you for the mic. Um, thank you very much to the panel. I'm Vivian. I have a question. Um, I recently moved into the central city. It's about three years ago. And so I'm seeing it with new eyes and walking everywhere, taking buses. And congratulations to the council. The footpaths are amazing. They're well built. Uh, the buses run on time mostly. And I'm really, really enjoying it. My question is, is anybody thinking of the air quality? That's the one thing I'm noticing. I've noticed since I moved into the city, um, I'm walking down the road and I'm getting whiffs of diesel and fumes, and that's my question. I'm not sure if this is in your um, scope, but that's my question. Thank you, Vivian, very happy to answer that. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, having said that, that doesn't mean it's gonna change overnight. <laughs> But the answer is yes. We, uh, we regularly monitor, I think it's about two or three sites in the city centre, plus a whole bunch else around the region. Uh, and you're right, there are certain parts, particularly down towards um, Key Street and things, which are uh, incredibly um, high in, in, in toxins, main, mainly from idling cars. So uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we are doing work, whether it's the electrification of the bus fleet, uh, we will be... Um, it's going to get harder and harder to bring cars into the city centre. No surprise to you tonight for those of you who had to try and find a park, but that's just going to get harder and harder. Uh, and we're not apologising for that because we, we want to be able to provide the options of public transport and other ways of getting in here. Uh, so, look, there are going to be changes. Things are going to improve, uh, and we are working on that. Thank you. I'm going to jump in quickly with a quick question uh, back to you. I, I guess, uh, um, well... Well, I guess, uh, Elizabeth, it's called, what is the cost of a robot? <laughs> um, well, there are lots of different kinds of robots, and they have different prices. The power of the seal is quite expensive. It's um, $7,000. So for an individual, it's quite, you know, expensive, but there are, you know, for a rest time facility, retirement village, <laughs> they can buy one for many people to share. Um, there are other people working on other much cheaper kinds of pet type robots, more like $100. Um, but the research hasn't been done on how beneficial they are compared to the SEAL robot. So the SEAL one has had the most research done on it. Uh, the other robots, like the cognitive reminder ones, um, they are more like $4,000. And, you know, a lot of these robots are still in the research phase and you can't actually buy them. Um, but, you know, Alexa, for example, 
that's only $150. So if you don't want one of the physically assisted ones, it's, it's pretty cheap. Essentially, the more arms or legs or moving parts it's got to it, the more expensive it's going to be. Do they catch rats? <laughs> there's, a, there's a plague of rats I heard on the radio this morning, including my good self, The summer has produced, yeah. There might be some that catch rats, but I don't know about them. <laughs> Thank you. Now there's a couple of other questions. Yes, please. Thank you. A um, couple of things. The bus service is not very reliable. Sometimes you wait. You know, there's supposed to be one coming. You wait. N nothing happens. And then the next thing, there's two come past very fast. And half the time, second bus, even if you haven't caught the first bus, has disappeared. It's gone so fast. It's, they have little races, I think, sometimes to get through. <laughs> the other thing is that I'm very concerned that nobody has mentioned the Hauraki Gog. And that's our lifeblood. And it's very, very important that we should take care of it and that we shouldn't keep on dropping bits of um, developments into the place mm. and letting all the killing what's underneath so that, the, you know, we, sure. we have far less seabirds these days. We used to have, I used to remember the flocks of seabirds. Not now. Very few. And why? It's not just the nesting places which get disturbed, but it's also the fact that there's far less fish because we're not looking after our stocks. We're not looking after our land, and that's the most important thing of all. Thank you. Very fine. Thank you. I have to say on Saturday, I, Sunday, I went to Waiheke and, and was asked to chair the meeting. This is a wonderful meeting, I have to say, after Waiheke. But they should listen to that kind of thing because they want to change the system. And they love Auckland Transport on Waiheke. <clears throat> they haven't known about those buses that whiz by very quickly. Back to, at the back, may I go there and I'll come to you. Hi, you've got a mic? Hello, hello. Uh, yeah. So, right. so oh, Bob, yeah. Hi, um, my name is Paul and Kira everybody. Um, I'm a grandparent. Uh, I, I'm a Westies as well for 25 years. Yeah, people used to tell me before I, I step into New Zealand, they say, why you go to the Y West? But I think it has developed some good. And I used to, uh, I should thank uh, all on transport that uh, I use train every day regularly. And uh, and, uh, and I thank the uh, super go kart so I can move around and I don't feel isolated and so on. Yes. And because I want to be active, I'm, I'm 69 now. And uh, I walk about one or two hours a day. So, and also thank to Maori Warden. Uh, always keep me safe when I go back at night time. And uh, I think it's a very useful uh, service to the, to the public sure, sure. safety, especially when I'm old. And you see, see young men group together, I get a bit frightened <laughs> at times with the trains and so on. Um, now, uh, so, so because I'm with this, um, I, I want to direct the question is, uh, I've, heard, I've heard that uh, Volunteer, grandparents, uh, all these are values to the community uh, for the well-being and all these things. And, uh, and especially the, the thing is, uh, especially speaking for Asian community or any city that uh, the grandparents is a valuable to the to, to the uh, as Korea explained and so on. Although, well, yeah. So the thing is. Uh, I like to say something about the immigration policy. I'm not. I'm not sure what is the the situation now that they are not really encouraging reunion policy for parents to come to with their parents. So I don't know that is is serve a good purpose for the society and the for well-being. I think we should try to influence the government or the immigration that they should think in terms of. Thank okay, you. Yes, thank uh, you. So Gloria, I think, is more than able to... Yes, thank you. You got that. Um, I think in terms of the uh, immigration policy, we, our organization have been consulted as well. So uh, definitely we gave the feedback, actually, uh, because of the birth control policy in China. So now the skilled migrant, uh, like at my age, we are all the only child in China. 
So uh, we do carry the responsibility by ourselves to take care of our, our, our parents. So if our parents cannot stay with us, which means we need to have another plan to stay with them in the future. So that's the reality, and that's our obligation and the responsibility that we carry. Yeah, but I, I also understand about the um, uh, rapid uh, growth of the uh, of the population over here in New Zealand, and the government they have the policy try to control uh, that kind of uh, increase the population based on some policies to ensure the health and safety and the overall operation of the society because of our uh, capacity of the society is there, but the increasing population uh, and the speed is con constantly growing. Um, however, uh, as I mentioned, and I fully support with you, so if we want to, uh, immigration is definitely a key source for having uh, one of the main channels to keeping the knowledge and skills for the New Zealand society for development, and in the meantime, it's very important uh, for the economic development. So if the government want to keep this trend and contribution of skilled migrant continuing, uh, this kind of family renew, renew, reunion policy needs to be reconsidered in the future whenever it's possible. That's the reality and then, yeah. Good question and very good answer, thank you. I'll jump here quickly before we go back to you and that's what language should be used to describe people over a certain age as many of us just do not associate with old senior, you bet, as there is always someone older. Smart question. <laughs> Does anyone want to grab what, that, Janet or Glenn? They talk about, as I think you see in, your, in the papers you've got, you, you talk about, they talk about the, the young old, the old, and the... Ancient. <laughs> we won't go there. The terminology certainly but needs to change, yes. right? I agree. But personally, I don't mind people talking about people being old. I'm quite proud of the wrinkles. Yeah. Because my family good. does not have a good history. My parents both died before they were 60. My mother died at 50 and my father at 57. So I think I've done pretty well to get to the stage I am. And I don't mind if they tell me I need polyfiller. That's all right. <laughs> I'd never say that to you, Janet. No, you wouldn't dare. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Janet. Uh, now, where was the mic? Sir, in the middle. Thank you. Here, here's one coming for you. My question's on the uh, transport. Um, mm -hmm. It's good that we sort of will take the bus and, and the train. Um, but what are we doing about, like, yesterday... Um, uh, met somebody at the Newmarket station. The, my, the friend that we were walking with had to come from uh, New Lynn, well, from Huya uh, to New Lynn. There's nowhere to sort of park at New Lynn. There's no buses to Huya. Uh, obviously, that's in isolation. How are we going to sort of... Obviously, we're encouraging people to sort of not drive into the city. Um, yeah. What are we doing in terms of trying to actually make the other end of the transport <coughs> loops work. The idea of getting to Devonport and then finding well, there's only buses up the road every half hour in the middle of the day isn't much fun to, I got that far. Now how do I get how the do next get bit there? down the link? Yeah, it's a brave question. Megan. The, the honest answer, of course, is that it is a work in progress. And for those of you who've lived in Auckland for, for a long time, perhaps your whole lives, um, certainly over the last 10 years or so, um, would hopefully agree that there's been an you know, enormous improvement um, in, the, in the amount and, and choice and opportunity of public transport. Are we there yet? No. Uh, you know, are we perfect? No. Uh, so, look, you're, you're absolutely right, though, that kind of that last mile, that, that last bit... Thing, get it, getting to a piece of public transport um, or getting home um, is probably the most difficult part of the puzzle. Getting into a centre or so, you know, is, is kind of the easy bit. Uh, she says that without having to find the budget for it, but you know what I mean. So, uh, look, and I also think of, um, dare I mention e-scooters, but, you know, there will be other mobility options coming just through technology and all sorts, whether it's scooters that you can sit on, um, you know, the, the, 
Who knows what can come into the future? So the car is not going to always be the only thing that's going to get you that last bit. Uh, I don't know what that might be, but there will always need to be some car-based you know, transport in Auckland, and we will just continue to get better and better around um, that public transport provision. Uh, anonymous here says, is there any mobility options such as adult tricycles on the horizon? I, I do, but look, I know in other, in other cities that, or they're starting to trial, yeah, those kind of um, trikes, bikes that are more like mobility scooters in the sense of sitting on them, having the opportunity to have put bags or kind of, you know, luggage around it. So absolutely that's, that's being done, probably hasn't quite hit here yet, but I, and there's drones, there's all sorts, I mean, look, who knows what the opportunities will be, and they'll carry people at some point. Save us from that. At the back. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so yeah. my name's Ruth. Um, yeah. My question, I think, touches on a number of things that have been spoken about um, tonight. Janet Close spoke earlier about institutional knowledge and and the great sort of wisdom expertise. I mean, our older people. I mean, when, when I was a kid, people got to sixteen, you just thought they were sitting in God's waiting room. And 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 our attitudes to age and and our aging, you know, it's different now. Now sixty is young. It's not old anymore. It is young. Um, and, and so the whole the whole thing has just, you know, changed. But there's a, you know you talked about the the loyalty, the expertise, the fabulous contribution that people still have to make into their nineties until they're a hundred and they're on their surfboard and whatever they're doing, which was un, unheard of when I was a kid. Um, we've talked about transport, about difficulties for the older people with transport, about things like service centres being centralised and moving away from where people live. And I've got a real issue with how we keep our um, ageing population more engaged. How do we communicate with them? And I see this a lot from council where every consultation, have your say, have your say, but only if you're online. Only if you can do it online. And there'll be a service centre miles and miles away that you have to get three buses to um, to pick up a hard copy if you're somebody who isn't technically aware and doesn't have the facility this also affects our older people and the lower socios who don't have laptops and all that tech at home and they're not on their devices. And, you know, some of you are. The people here in this room probably all are. But there are lots who are not who probably don't know about tonight and might have a valuable contribution because they don't have the money for the laptop, the device, the flash stuff. They don't, they're not tech aware, whatever. So, you know, I, I was involved in a consultation recently where... Um, the local Grey Power branch said, we want to send this out to our 3,000 members. Three weeks later, a couple of days before the consultation closed... Now, is there a question going to pop yeah, up in a minute? Yeah, yeah. Um, council finally turned up with some hard copies. It was too late for us to post them out to the army. So how, what are council going to do to, to reach out and make sure that older people can be engaged on whatever topic if they're interested in, because they're just being left out? Uh, I, hear, I hear that uh, and understand, and I, I mean, I'll certainly take that back, and I've got colleagues in the room that are hearing that too. Uh, look, it is an issue, I totally agree. Also, there are um, lower socioeconomic areas. There are young people that don't have devices, and, and you know, there's, so there's affordabilities at all ends of the spectrum, uh, but, but certainly um, ability and, and affordability um, with the older people as well. So, look, I hear that. I'm not, I, I can't promise that we're perfect, but we do need to still provide opportunities online and and offline, uh, more face-to-face. -face and closer understand. to home. Thank you. Now, I'm sorry. Thank you for waiting. Uh, Janet, I'll, I'll just... Thank you for waiting. OK, thank you. Um, is this working yet? Uh, a few years ago, when I was on the local board, here locally, um, I was approached hello. by... Hello there, <laughs> Cousy Burrow. <laughs> um, I was approached by a... Contacted by a woman in her 80s who had no trouble getting into town on the bus, but she had lost her nerve about walking up Queen Street because since there was no longer a line down the middle of the pavement, swishy new black pavements, couldn't have a, dark, a white line down them, she was faced with walking up through a tide of people coming towards her, the full width of the pavement, all with their noses and their phones, nobody looking where they were going, and she was frail, and she just said, I can no longer go into town because I can't handle that at all. So is she going to be met at the bus stop by a robot or a mobility scooter of some... 
description? How do we meet, deal with that? That's a tough one. Don't we see it? Uh, the, the new generation addicted, totally addicted to the iPhone. Yeah. Um, who's brave enough to... Well, uh, yeah, what about Elizabeth? I think uh, Elizabeth the, the one option would be to, to get on the link bus and take it and have a nice little free ride round until you get to where you want to go. I haven't tried it yet, but I'm going to. Steve Brunius says the best bus is, the, is number 18. It gives you a tour of the whole yes, Auckland. There is, but Steve Brunius would say one. that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Elizabeth, do you well, want it's to... It's a very genuine question. Yeah. And, yes. and I agree with the, the white line down the middle. But then people don't drive always on the right side either, do they? Thank you. It's a good question. Uh, sir, at the back. Uh, yes, I'd like to make a, a short observation and, and a question arising yes. from that. Sure. Um, as, as you get older, you become much more uh, aware of your mortality. Uh, really? I go to my uh, wine shop sometimes, and the guy might say, uh, this is going to be a really good wine in 10 years' time. But I say, I don't want one in 10 years' time. <laughs> I want it now. And I'd make the same observation about a lot we're hearing tonight. I mean, I want to know what's going to happen in my lifetime that will help me as an aged person. And what I'm getting is that, frankly, we don't want old people in the city centre because the public transport's not going to get them there all that efficiently. And if it does, they're going to get run over or bowled over by a, by a scooter or something anyway. What you need to be aware of is that older people are concerned about their vulnerability to being knocked over, to having bones broken, all that sort of thing. And all this thing about scooters and such like, mm. actually is pretty scary. And, and I don't think that's a solution. I think you're not giving enough thought at all to making this friendly to, to older people. So what is the policy for You're looking after older people? You're getting some applause for this. Uh, what was your question? Because it was a hell of a good statement. Oh, um, what was, what, did you have a question? Well, the on? question is, yeah. how are you going to make Auckland City friendly to older people when everything that I'm hearing is saying we don't want older people there, oh. we're going to cut them out? Well, not in this uh, hall. I think that we love the idea of being older, and uh, there's a lot of courage in this room. But it takes courage out there. I have to. I look. Yeah. Uh, totally I, agree with you. Cars, and and. They need mobility parking places. Okay. They need places where it's easy for them to do that. I mean, I, my mum, who is 99, just died last year, and she loved to go out to those sort of things. But without mobility spaces and that sort of thing, it's impossible. Thank so you. basically you're saying the CBD is becoming a, a, an age-unfriendly area, basically. Is that what I'm hearing? Thank you. Thank you. One more question, and then we're going to... Pull um, just, this together. Let me just really quickly. Um, that you're, no, you're mishearing what I'm saying. I'm not saying it's uh, it's it's unfriendly, and we're not deliberately um, making it hard for um, for anyone with a disability or access. But we do know that there needs to be change in this city. Some of which will happen in our lifetime, and some of it will be in our kids' grandkids' lifetime uh, around the way in which we we live in the city and and move around it. So it's absolutely fundamental that when people can move, whether it's in a car, a bus, a train, in a scooter, whatever, wherever, however you're moving, that you can get somewhere safely, you can do whatever you need to do, and then you get back home safely. So that's absolutely what we're trying to do. Are we there yet? No. So we've got, we've got stuff we'll do, some in your lifetime, some not in your lifetime. Um, the other thing is, remember, we are, this is exactly what we're engaging on right now, which is this age-friendly uh, action plan. We're taking notes please get involved in that engagement. Again, face-to-face, -face, online, whatever that looks like for you, because these are the changes we can make quickly. Are there ways, that, is there lines down the pavement, for example, that's going to help? I don't know, you know these, these kinds of things we want to hear from you. So that's what we're talking about tonight. Thank you very much. Yes, please, quickly, um, I agree with the mobility parks comment down there. Um, we've been, the panel has brought that up on a regular occasions with Auckland Transport. At the moment, they, they tell us that they're doing a trial in um, Devonport to make sure that they can use, like a shuttle that you can 
get to go to the, to the ferry, for instance. Now, how successful that has been, I don't know um, categorically, but I've heard things that are not too good about that. Uh, the, the argument that was put to us was that you won't need to worry about the, the um, mobility parking because there'll be other ways to get you to where you want to go. So that's a real thing that we'll be keep, work, keep working on. Could I just say, too, that I, I really apologise. At the beginning, I should have mentioned that some of my colleagues are here with us tonight. And um, I think my Deputy Chair David is here. David Wonghop, is he? There he is. David Wonghop. And um, Judy Blakey. No, Judy. Over Hi. here. And Mary Tunks. Sure is Mary. there anyone I've missed? Thank you for, I, I thank what, you you for acknowledging missed. those people. You They're the ones Janet. that have helped to get us where we are. You promised that you'd finish the night with a poem. Because not only are you a damn good counsellor, but you're a damn good poet. And you said, I'll bring my poem along. Oh, my poem along. Oh, you, you did. Do you want to quickly so, round up this wonderful hour with a poem? And then we're going to ask Ross Clow to pop up on stage. Well, you, you're free and to thank go you now all. if you'd rather. <laughs> It's actually one that some of you here have heard before, that I did last year for uh, the International Day of the Older People person at uh, AUT. The and floor is yours, Janet. Valerie Wrightson here in front of me, so I'll probably bumble through like I did last time. I called it Where Are We? <clears throat> and it starts off. We've, I always say you should have a bit of fun along the way, even if they're serious things you're talking about. So this is my take. Where are we? We've reached the point where, where tweaks in joints now plague our daily life, where dental crowns bring massive frowns that lead to mental strife. We see our doc, who thinks old croc, but checks our varied ills, then does the tests and he knows best, so we just take the pills. Cataracts for the lops, remember the drops, recovered better sight. Telly's now clear, it's not even near, everything seems so bright. Podiatrist calls, discomfort galls, can't even reach our toes. Nails are soon clipped, corns are all nipped, calluses finally goes. TV at full bore. Folks' ears get sore. Something needs to be done. Audio test. Oh, what a pest. But AIDS are really such fun. Just drop my keys. Can't get on my knees. Back aching. Oh, what a sight. Arches that fall. Won't get to the ball. Think it's an early night. Struggle to bed. What's that you said? Age is a time to rest. Fat chance of that. Here comes the cat, being as usual a pest. Morpheus comes, cat gently hums, both in the land of dreams. In our prime there, without a care, fit as a fiddle, it seems. Soon morning will break, the bed I will make. Routine is so fulfilling. See you next year. Perhaps even here, God willing. <laughs> Thank you, Janet.